go for. Uh, thanks, Eva. Thanks very much for the, the invitation uh, to, to speak, and hello, everyone who's here. Um, so Eva uh, and Natalia asked me to speak a little bit about uh, injury risk assessment in sport, um, and I guess that's the theme of the day. And the plan, um, I always like to start with a bit of plan, just so you know what to expect. Um, I'm just going to go through a little bit I kind of my personal injury risk and prevention journey, and I'll explain why in a second. And then the, the main topic to speak about um, that ever, ever asked me was around the association versus prediction. Uh, then I'm going to just speak a little bit about sharks and ice cream. Uh, and then a final example, a, a few examples of injury risk assessment and practice. So trying to combine that research and practical element. My disclaimer before I start is I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a data scientist, and I'm not a statistician. I'm just learning this stuff as well, um, studying and trying to, to improve. But it's all came from a practical, um, a practical background and questions that I've had in practice. And they're just trying to get better. So if we've got complicated questions around causality and prediction and stuff, um, bear with me because I'm, I'm learning like a lot of people. These are some key people that, that I follow and that I speak to and uh, I, I work with. So Patrick Ward in Seattle, Franklin Pulitzeri, sure that, uh, everyone knows Franco in Australia, um, Zachary Binney, very interesting epidemiologist, Rasmus Nielsen, and of course, Ebert, who's invited and put together this symposium. So these are the, the key people that I'm, I'm learning from and I would suggest to follow their, their work. So to start my, my journey, I, I started in practice. So my background is a fitness coach and sports scientist. And I started out at Celtic Football Club. I then worked in a team in Australia. Then I've come back to the UK, worked again in Australia with the national team. And then I went to Lille Football Club in, in France with a, a good friend and who was my PhD supervisor, Greg Dupont. Uh, we actually worked together in Celtic, so it's a, a bit of an evolution. And that's when it was Greg that really got me started in research um, and, no and methods and the sort of rigor that might be needed in practice because he implemented uh, a lot of science and research in the practical setting. And we went into, so I started the PhD and I thought, ah, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to be able to predict all the injuries. Um, and then if this works, this is a famous uh, show in the UK, Only Fools and Horses, Bellboy is a street trader in London. Um, and this is pretty much what we're thinking at this point. Uh, I don't know if you could hear that or not. Could you hear that, the video of it? No, there was no sound. Sorry. Ah, uh, okay. That's all right. So basically, it's, um, it's basically, there's a famous saying in the show because the um, wheeler dealers working in the markets and it's this time next year, Rodney will be millionaires. So it was a kind of a similar sort of thing. We're thinking how we can break out all these injuries, we'll be able to sell uh, injury prediction models, which are going to sold and people are probably making money. But I think not um, maybe justified. So as I went through the journey of the PhD, I began to realize, okay, hang on, this isn't so easy. It's not that easy to predict. Uh, and Natalia spoke a bit about that. Then we found some associations, so I'm starting to get into the kind of theme of the project. Um, and that's that's pretty much what I was like at the time, because it, and it's a journey, I guess, as a researcher as well, that I went through of um, wanting to find something. Uh, and if, or the thought that if you don't find something, it's a, you've, it's a failure or it's not going to be a good paper um, because it's not found anything. So, so I was very happy to find some stuff, which I've learned now is not, not the way to go but we're evolving and learning and becoming better. Then I went to Arsenal and I've went more into uh, the R&D research and development side, the, the background time, trying to improve the decisions that we make and add the rigor and integrity so that when you're working in the field, you can make better decisions because that's what would have been great throughout that journey for me. So that's what we're trying to do in Arsenal now. The last five years in Arsenal, well, it's becoming clear that predicting injuries may actually be impossible. It might not be possible to do what we want to do. And there's a lot of reasons uh, that I'm going to go through. 
and to, including terminology, including reporting and interpretation of papers, biases that are in um, papers, overselling things that are not that are not real. So it's a it's a real challenge for us. Um, and I learn a lot. These are um, our day analysts in Arsenal, Sarah Rudd, Mikel, and Arge. Um, and I've learned a lot from them. We're working a lot, and we're, we've got projects with Eva and Natalia at the moment because uh, we want to try and keep up to date and to do the right thing, not rely on people coming and telling us that they can predict the injuries. We, we want to do it for ourselves and know where the data is coming from, how it's been treated, um, and if findings are true or not. Uh, and now I'm at the point where I'm learning about the... Uh, I've been introduced to the sharks and ice cream, which I'll bring in shortly. And we, we published this study in um, 2017 with Maurizio Franchini, with Aaron Coots, uh, around this association prediction conundrum, um, because it, it's the it's what everybody wants to do. We all want, it would be great to be able to predict if something happens, um, if it's an injury or, or whatever it is in our life, it would be, it would be great. Um, and this is just a kind of snapshot of the things that we've been that are coming to us, and why we might might be misinterpreting uh, how good prediction or how closely we can predict injuries. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of uh, terms and papers saying that things are important; they can predict. Um, certain things are the problem. So all of the terminology is really around either we can predict something or if we change something, um, it will change the injury outcome. So in other words, it's a causal inference. And it's not only, I, I always put up workloads and injury because I do a lot of work in that obviously, but it's not, it's not only that. Um, there's machine learning that's trying to predict winning the World Cup. Uh, and I think all of them had different, different predictions. Maybe one got it right, which might just have been random. Uh, we're always, and this comes from a practical pers perspective. People are trying to sell us all the time um, the new mo the new machine to to predict performance or to find the new Messi uh, or to predict the time to return to play. So, so these that's the rationale of where our uh, editorial came from. Is that these are things we face in practice, and we want people to understand is it true or not, and can we have confidence in what people are trying to sell us? So yeah, we're under pressure to predict things from the key stakeholders, also from ourselves. So you're getting questions, what about this player? Should we sign him? Should we not sign him? Do we keep this player? Do we get rid of them? Um, uh, yeah, so those sort of questions. Again, the confusion. And the big thing is we need to be careful with the message we give the coach because in the worst case, we're wrong. Um, so if, it, if we're saying that we're going to predict an injury, we might be wrong and you don't get injured. That's actually... That's good, but the message we've given the coach has been different. And then for them to listen to us after will be more difficult. They'll lose uh, faith in the metric, but they might lose faith in ourselves as well and the, and the person giving the message, which would be a disaster. Uh, and this is just a summary basically of what we said in, at the end of the, the editorial. The, when we're looking at association, it's explanatory power. So it helps us understand factors that may be linked to an outcome. And this might be due to direct or indirect causation, but we can't, we can't tell. And that's generally what papers report. So although the, although, and it's not only other papers, I'll show some examples of mine, where I've, I've, I could have interpreted or reported things uh, better. I imagine people are still um, registering. And predictive power, that allows us to classify uh, an outcome at the individual level, so at the individual player or individual person level. So two very different things. And then there's a nice paper from Pepe that we used in that editorial um, mm -hmm. who explained with some some modeled data that even with strong associations, it may, might not even be possible to predict. That's the paper here, 2004, I think. And when we looked at the, um, uh, the diagnostic accuracy of, of, um, of for an outcome, basically these, these numbers here, are the odds ratios, so the odds for something to, to happen. And then if we're at one, then it's a perfect di diagnostic accuracy. It means we, we uh, predict the outcome perfectly. And what I explained is that if, if we're at three, so three times the odds, then it still doesn't mean 
it's probably poor predictive capacity. Only when it got to about 16, an odds ratio of 16, did it start to become predictive. And for it to be almost perfect, an almost perfect model, um, you were looking at an odds ratio of 171. Now, that's not a, a golden rule or these numbers aren't set in stone, but it was just a nice way to show that, because in our papers, we will see uh, odds ratios of 1.15 and it's significant. So we so we, we, we think, oh, it's, it's, it's uh, linked with injury. It's important, but it might... It might not be the case. So this just opened our eyes a bit more, and we explained that in the editorial, and I'm happy to share that wherever, um, or the, the link anyway, I can share the paper. Uh, what we've done as well is we wanted to, we've done a search of talent, performance, and injury areas. So we didn't want to just pick, up, pick on injury. We wanted to see uh, if this is just a common problem that exists. And on the systematic search, we looked for our papers on talent prediction uh, sensitivity. So basically, it analyzes that we're looking at the predictive or diagnostic accuracy of, of whatever it was they were trying to sell. And as you can see here, ones that have used uh, it's, it's basically in here you have, if they used it in the title, the abstract, these terms, this is only how many actually analyzed these uh, these qualities so it was the same for talent it was the same for performance and it was uh, the same for injury so it seems to be a common problem that we we claim we're looking at something and we don't actually do the analysis for that claim so we're claiming that something predicts something and then we don't test for it and then we report that it's predicted it and again we didn't test for it so it's it's hard for practitioners because we are not trained and probably the education system needs to change but we are not uh, and maybe we shouldn't actually have to be. We should trust people to do the good job. Um, but it's hard to know when you read a paper as a practitioner um, to un unpack the methods and unpack the results. So we really need to rely on us doing the, the research and interpreting and reporting properly. So that's where it all came from. We then decided to go, because there was a lot of uh, studies on workload and injury. So we thought, OK, we're going to have a look now and, and see. And Maurizio Franchini, uh, it was the first that I'm aware of to do to look at this association prediction uh, in football, looking at workload injury. And then we followed it up. So it was one team over three seasons, and then we followed it up with the UEFA study with Jan and Greg um, looking at five teams in the UEFA Elite Club injury study. And basically what we found uh, in Maurizio's paper is that there was an association with um, some workload metrics with a non-contact injury. So there was associations. Then when we followed it up with, with more teams, we also found some significant associations linked with injury. But when we looked at the uh, the predictive ability of, of workload, so when it exceeded a certain threshold, did an, actual, an injury actually occur or not? Uh, I did want to put a poll on, but I, I didn't know how to do it on Microsoft um, Teams. But basically, the question I put to you, and you can answer to yourself just now, and if you're reading the table and understand the table, then you'll know the answer. But out of 300, so roughly 300 injuries, when the when um, the threshold was exceeded, where we found an association with injury, how many times do you think an injury actually occurred? Because if it was perfect diagnostic accuracy, perfect predictive um accuracy, then there would be 300 injuries. So every time it went over that threshold, there would be an injury. But what we found is in here, so of roughly 300 injuries, just under, only 17 times did an injury occur, um, and only 14 did, did an injury occur in, uh, in a different acute chronic ratio. So basically, yeah, we found an association, but are we really going to give a message to a coach that he may he or she might get injured based on those those figures i'm not so sure and then we followed up with more teams uh, more injuries uh, just to to see if we if it was similar to replicate uh, and we found pretty much the same thing so out of 600 injuries 22 times when we, re we exceeded this threshold did an injury occur so, um, um, so it means like almost 600 times it actually didn't occur um, and then it was similar here as well. So, so that's that. Our main aim there was to understand 
for ourselves also. What, what are we looking at when, we're, when a paper's finding uh, an association versus saying it predicts? But the, rea- the reality is that it's, it's still important. It doesn't mean that we have to stop using something. It's just we need to understand what we are using and use it within those limitations and context because it's, it's clearly important for practitioners in the field. And this is a lot of... Uh, a lot of survey work that we've done with um, within FIFA and within UEFA. Uh, we didn't publish this, but we also done the Women's World Cup in Canada. We've done the under 17s men's and the under 20 men's as well. And we just uh, we just wanted to know what their perceptions and experiences were. What did they think was important for non-contact injury? Uh, and this is basically what we found. So it goes back to Natalia's. And she's been talking about the complex, the complexity and the web of determinants uh, and stuff. So we we decided to build a subjective web just to just to get an idea of um, within our group, just to get an idea of how complex this may actually be, um, and why looking at one paper with load or one paper with something else um, may not be so clear that that one thing uh, can predict anything. And this is what we found. So this is subjective only. But we found um, risks. So the importance was placed on internal load, external load, previous injury, age, strength-related, movement-related, communication, importance of the match, travel, climate, um, psychology. And then we started to link them. We started to try, and we've not done directions of of the, um, the potential interactions as well, but we've just tried to link them based on... Uh, three or four of us just going through this, so don't take this as gospel. But as you can see, it just kept going going on and on and on. And then at the, the bottom there, we've got other. So the, there was other risk factors that practitioners thought were important. So I think if we're talking about, um, yeah, should we be surprised that, we, that it's been difficult to predict injury? And I think I think not. And I think when we see studies and we have companies trying to sell us things that will predict injury, we need to be very, very careful um, because I don't believe it's so simple. I think we're moving towards our future, but we've got a lot of issues. Uh, and Eva and Natalia, we've come across a few on the work we're doing with uh, with Arsenal the, that makes it look more difficult than we in, initially thought. Um, but we're not so surprised. So that's, that was a kind of overview of the, the maybe the, how complex injury might be based on our subjectivity. Um, and this is just a, a small small example of colour coded just to give a snapshot. So it's also dynamic and I, I think Natalia spoke about that as well. So it's not just that, that this one here just doesn't it doesn't stay like that. Um, that's not your if that's your risk profile, it's not gonna um, or your risk factors, then you everyone's got a profile and it will change. And that's what Natalia's trying to trying to work on. So here we have, uh, so it's based on real data from a, from a long time ago. This is an Arsenal data. But uh, we had a player who had a ma- home match in the league with no previous week match. So when we're looking at that web of determinants before, or the, the, the risk factor I showed you before, uh, with this player, this, is, this would be his hypothetical um, risk profile just for this purpose. So he's, he's looking all right. He's looking quite good. But then we had a match in Russia on the Wednesday in the Champions League. He played 94 minutes in the first match. So before playing that match, it's, the, the, the risk has changed again. So um, things like travel, the environment, it was, it was extremely cold. I think it was minus 17 with the, the wind chill factor. Um, it had an imbalance on strength and, strength and the hamstring um, from the previous match. So there was there was different things here that potentially based on that web may may um, be risk factors, but then it was substituted at 65 minutes, in the third match we were playing we was at home on a Sunday, um, and and basically the thing, some of the colours aren't proper there they've not come over when I pasted them but basically strength kind of went back to normal, uh, different things were back within his norm so I think that, that's what we're looking at is more kind of anomalies, things that are not that are out of place that we then need to have a conversation around. So it just shows you from this to this to this to this. 
for this. And that's in the space of a week. It might even change within the day. So will we ever be able to predict injuries? Uh, this is a paper from Franco that's it's in press at the moment, so it's not published yet. And what he explains is that when we're looking at associations, these can help drive hypotheses and future studies and help uh, contribute to frameworks and test the frameworks. So success, successful predictive models are theoretically possible, although very, very, very difficult. Um, and I think what got me in the beginning that I struggled with interpreting, I still struggle with interpreting predictive, um, like what Natalia was talking about. I, I struggle with the, to really analyse those papers super well. Uh, but one thing that we've learned in Arsenal and the guys there have taught me is that a lot of the time the studies that are coming out with these, uh, with decision trees, um, uh, random forest things, uh, is basically that they don't test, the, the data is based on, sorry, the results are based on data that the, the model has seen, and it's not been tested on unseen data. So basically it learns it, it learns to predict from the uh, the data it sees, but then when you give it new data, like ne the next season, and it doesn't know what's happening, they, they tend to fail. So that's a telltale sign for me now. Uh, and again, I'm not an expert on this, so ever uh, Natalia will be able to, to go into this deeper. But as, as a practitioner that's and a learning researcher in this field, uh, in this kind of statistical data science field, that's been helpful. Uh, and the big thing Franco gets across uh, in this new paper as well is that even if we find associations and even if something is predictive, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, uh, it's a cause of the outcome. And that's where it brings me to the sharks and the ice cream, because there's a, a very nice example about this. Uh, and that it's even possible to find associations and predict the number of shark attacks based on the number of ice creams sold. So that's easy. It means we, we sell less ice creams or we ban the ice cream trucks uh, and we won't, we won't get any more shark attacks. But I think we all know that that's, that's nonsense. But I think that's the danger we're in with some, within our area is that we, are, uh, we need to interpret the things a lot more cautiously. Um, and, and as researchers, we need to report to the others um, much more responsibly and much more carefully. Because manipulating an associated or predictive factor, oh, sorry, my screen just changed. Um, it doesn't, if we, it means if we change something and we alter something, we're assuming yeah, it's then going to alter that injury outcome, which is not the case. So if we change that load on that day, it means the injury, we are, we're assuming that because of that change, it's going to change the outcome, which is what we don't know. It's what we would like to know, but it's what we don't know. Okay, we need to bear that in mind. Research centers. Uh, so the, just the last part uh, of the presentation, I uh, just wanted to go through some papers that, that I've published and where I think I could have also, because um, I don't want to see that I'm, I'm criticising just other people and what I do is perfect, because it's, it's not. Um, um, we're, we're just trying to get better and involve, and um, there was a thing in nature recently about science being self-correcting, and uh, so I, I definitely believe in believe in that but here with this conclusion here we've said we've not said that predict something or if you change this it'll change something else but if we look at franco what franco said the association should drive hypotheses our conclusion was not to drive a hypothesis it was to say um, that it provides additional evidence for practitioners to consider the acute chronic workload ratio as one risk factor for non-contact injury in their players so it's if I, if I went back, I would, I would definitely um, interpret it because I would interpret it at the time um, and, re and report it differently. And it was the same in the paper we done with, um, with Mauricio. Sorry, trying to move that thing. Um, the overall, our findings provide justification for the implementation of a team-wide monitoring strategy of internal load in elite footballers. So again, but I think we could have interpreted and reported that a bit better, but we will, we will do it next time. And it goes right back to my PhD as well. So I never published this paper. I think it was probably the first one in football. And we've done about eight teams. We had maybe 500 injuries or so. We had a lot, we had a lot of injuries. Uh, so it was a big sample. But again, it was the same thing. I've, I've, I've basically sort of recommended that we can implement this to, to prevent injuries. 
So we need to be better and I need to be better. So what can we do in practice? This is the last part. Um, and we look at the sharks and ice cream uh, example. Franco explains, well, okay, we can increase Coast Guard surveillance. We give warnings to surfers, etc. cetera. Uh, I went on to the department, uh, the Australian government, to see what, what they recommend. And they have, they've got a number of recommendations. So they're not predicting that these shark attacks are uh, happen, but they're given some measures to try and reduce that risk. And that's when it comes back to this sort of risk management uh, and risk assessment, which comes within the management. Uh, quickly, I'll run through these. So combining research and practice, we published this paper uh, a couple of years ago as well. It basically helps us make decisions in practice um, based on evidence, based on practical experience, based on expert opinion, based on considered judgment, feasibility. Uh, and there's a few steps to it. So first step is to search and assess. So we need to know, is it, is it useful for us? Do we want to go any further? If it's yes, then okay, let's search the literature. We're looking at the, the evidence uh, levels. So highest is meta-analysis, systematic review of RCTs, all the way to expert opinion. We have to look at the quality rating because not all that glitters is gold. It was one of Claire and uh, Claire Ardern and Adam Weir's papers. Um, so it's important because we might have a high level of evidence paper that's poor quality. Then we need to interpret it in a second step. So we put together an evidence table to understand what um, what is the evidence telling us, what is the quality of the evidence, what's the experts saying. And then importantly, we need to have this considered judgment. I'm just going to move this thing. Then. Um, and then we need to combine it with, with this considered judgment to arrive at a decision. And in sport, things aren't black or white or it's not a yes or no. Um, it's, it's, there's grey areas, so and we can't hang our hat on uh, one or the other. It, it wouldn't make sense. So we, we adapted this from Harbour and Miller. Uh, so it's from, it's used by doctors originally to prescribe medication. Um, and we basically adapted it uh, with Greg and Leland and been working on it ever since. So if we look at workload as a risk factor, uh, this one's not published yet, it's in review from uh, Barthélemy Delacroix. Uh, and essentially this is what he's found in terms of the evidence, the types of evidence. Uh, there's been a lot of expert opinions, surveys that, that we've done as well. Uh, the, then we analysed the quality, the risk of bias. Uh, I need to move this thing again, can't read it. Uh, so studies generally high risk of bias, poor reporting, easy to misinterpret, predictive ability poor, none look at causation, results are conflicting. So some say increased risk, decreased risk, sweet spot, nothing. Um, the all the metrics are different, so it's very confusing. Overall, there's no evidence for workload as a risk factor for injury. So when we look at considered judgment, it may result in a wrong classification because we don't know if the risk is lower, higher, or, pre or protective, and we don't know if it's causal. So as a risk factor, currently, there's no evidence or there's, there's insufficient evidence to suggest that it is a risk factor for, for injury. But when we look at it as a tool to inform practice, run through the same thing. So here, sorry, Eva, I need to keep moving you around. Um, so the same thing, studies generally at uh, risk of high bias, etc. but the considered judgment, okay, basic training principles of overload progression, common sense dictates to avoid too large spikes um, or not doing enough. We can provide some objective information uh, to inform discussions, provide the context uh, is considered. We can't predict and we can't be sure that manipulating this will change the injury, so we need to be careful in the, with the message to the coach. So basically that means the it's acceptable, so a level B is acceptable, so it's acceptable to use this, to use workload um, as a tool to inform practice. Uh, I've, not, I've lost track of time ever, so I'm not sure how long I've got. Oh, you're already over. Oh, I'm Apologies. <laughs> I'll go, I'll go down. <laughs> so we need to, we just we need to be careful that we're not selling, selling ice creams and the message that we give to the coach. And the last one, I'm going to skip to because I'm over. Is this one here? So you see the video, hopefully, and then I'm going to ask you a question. A question. So uh, this is a this is from 2009. Colin Williams had a medical a long time in Arsenal, um, and this still gets talked about. So basically, there was a player who had a hamstring tear. Uh, it was out for 16 days. It was a big game coming up on the 18th day, uh, and the question was asked. 
could they play? So going through the shared decision making process, everyone was aware of the risks, um, the the risks, the rewards, the coach, the player, everyone. Um, and the decision was made to put him on the bench. He went on the bench, uh, and then he came on. It was now now. He scored the first goal. Then he scored the second goal. Keep watching. Okay, so if you saw that, then uh, he scored the two goals, and just after scoring that goal, uh, he's had a, a re injury and been lost now for the next uh, three or four three or four weeks. Um, so Colin's question. Always is. Was that a successful? Was that was that a successful outcome or not? Was the was the decision to or that risk management and risk assessment was that a success or not? Um, and that's what it'd be good to have a poll. But I think it's uh, it's probably impossible to tell. But uh, yeah, I'll finish there. Ever sorry for going over. No, no need to be sorry about that. Um, I think this was a really interesting, uh, really interesting story, really interesting talk. Um, I think. Um, I enjoyed it at least, so I guess uh, others may. <laughs> at least, at least one person. <laughs> <laughs> others will have as well. Um, just, I think there's one question already waiting in the chat box, um, so we won't make this too long. Um, it's not really a question, but it's a question I wrote down, and this comment kind of attached to that. How would you define prediction? Me? Yes. How would, how would I define prediction? Um, so I think that the way, uh, for me, it would be that we can 100% say that something will happen. That would be the, that's the, the ideal. Um, and what I'm learning is that there's maybe levels of certainty within prediction that we, that we can have. So yeah, I think in an ideal world, the way I understood it is that, and the way it's been, the way it's sold to us in practice is that um, the prediction will definitely mean something. Something will happen. Hmm. But that's, that's how I've I've been been taught it. Uh, taught it. That's how I've kind of came up with it and been um, how it's been sold to me. But now I'm realizing that actually I, I don't think it's it's possible. But but um, maybe this is a bit of a dialogue we're getting here. If you look at the, the true definition of prediction, it says, back to entomology, uh, the old Latin word, it says it is what you think will happen instead of what you're certain of will happen. So in my regard, if you do all data science and if you have um, prediction models, they will give you information that you can mingle with your clinical expertise and then you give a informed decision to the field probably that's what happened in this final movie you showed where you also said there was this decision process going on are we willing to take this risk to have this probability um, yeah. and there's many factors because if you would make this decision now he's three weeks out they're not playing anyway so maybe you will take that risk whereas in the middle of the season and there's a big game coming next week you're not willing to take that risk so yeah. I think it's two different different things, um, and, yeah. and judging from the chat box, that is, uh, pe people are agreeing with that. Yeah. But do you think there's a bit mismatch there between what we can do with statistics and um, what we assume we want to get out of it? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think I think what we're chasing is not going to come. I think it's too. It's just too too complex. Um, it changes too much, it's, uh, it, the, and then I guess it, you would need an ideal world of the testing. The you know you need everything to be absolutely perfect, and, and professional sport is not by no means perfect, and it changes all the time. It's it's very um, yeah, there's a lot of unknowns, um, and with the work we've been doing, uh, as we've discussed quite a lot, we're now realizing as well the with one team, it's, I know you. I know you spoke about it, Natalia, having looking at one team or multiple teams, but 
we're finding it really difficult to get the numbers we need to really have a lot of confidence in what we're uh, what we want to show and uh, or what we want to predict or find probabilities of. Uh, and then if we increase it to teams, we lose the richness of, of the data, mm. which we've which we've found. So so you've either we've got this conundrum just now where we're we can have one team, so we've got Arsenal, we've got a really rich data set, um, we've got very well collected data, we, we know the reliability of the, the measures, um, but we we had 22 injuries in the in the model. And then if we want to do, so okay, if we need all of the Champions League or the Euro, Europe, European leagues to come in, but then we've got all different um, ways to measure load, we've got different technologies, we've got uh different screening tools we'll get every is I, I think the fee, i guess what i'm trying to say is the feasibility and the, the practicality worries me that we're not going to be able to do to do it and i wonder when we when do we call time on it do you know what i mean do we do we keep flogging a dead horse mm-hmm. or um i don't think it's at that point yet i don't think we're we're stopping yet but that yeah i don't, I don't want to keep doing something that, that's going to make no sense the problem is we have to We've got so many sales companies trying to sell us this stuff, and um, they, they, they we're kind of we can't do the work we want to do sometimes because we're trying to bust myths a lot. So we waste a lot of time trying to disprove people than trying to work on ways to improve. That makes sense. Makes perfect sense to me. So um, I guess for now, the time being, the money is still on hiring good personnel than buying new algorithms from. Uh, parties that state they can predict injury, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. I'd much rather invest in uh, in, in people. Um, and I don't, yeah, I think the, I think we're in danger of losing the, except I mean, it's for a kind of interesting time when stuff was still a little bit, not, not that it's old school, but it was still, um, it was quite simple. Hmm. And then technology sort of came in. So I've went through that transition. Um, and now that I, like I feel that we're at a point where we're losing human interaction and we're losing that that yeah that human element. Um, and I, I don't think we're ready for the robots to to take over yet. So I think I think we still need humans to master the decisions that have been made. So at the end decision, we still need the the human being. Uh, I think uh, we can't rely on machines to. Sounds good, but okay. Uh, with that, I, I can't get that context. Got it. Thank you, Alan, for your contribution. Thanks, Um, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Um, Enjoy the chat. Okay.